Welcome to the Soilcraft Regen Agronomy Podcast. At Soilcraft, our mission is to innovate and lead in the field of regenerative agronomy, forging a path that empowers farmers to produce food that nourishes and heals both the planet and its inhabitants. I wouldn't you welcome to the Soilcraft uh, Weekly Regen Podcast. We don't exactly have a title yet. I'm actually in studio with Craig, but this is going to be likely a more rare occurrence. We're going to do it when we can. But we want to bring to you, you know, Craig mentioned to me quite a while ago, hey, I think there, there's a good idea for this podcast. And so I said, well, okay, that's great, but I haven't done it. And so he kind of goaded me and said, um, when are we going to do that? Let's do it together. Oh, that's even better. Now I have an excuse. So what we're trying to do is bring you a weekly podcast, a short form, nothing long, I don't think, on what's going on in um, either the regen space or just the ag space that we're in. You know, we find that a lot of times there's a lot of groups we're a part of, um, and just an instance throughout our own week in our own crops or whatever, where there's this topic that comes up and it leaves us, you know, having a conversation and feeling like I really would like other people to hear about this, but those chat rooms, if you, or whatever, are maybe not always the most productive space to share them. So we bring you the weekly, th- this week in Regen. So not that either of us minds being the villain, but some of the conventional spaces don't really, you know, have conducive spaces for being the villain all the times. Exactly. So, um, well, this is our first installment and it comes from such an, a circumstance this last week. Um, there was a, a, an instance that came up in one of the um, ag groups on a herbicide um, residual, um, one in, in fact, that Craig is familiar with. So if you give it, if you can give, it's a mouthful of a chemistry, but you give some of the, the names. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, so it's in Zethker. Um, and so it's, I think it's known as, um, hammer, um, maybe contour plus anyway, it's, it's, uh, uh used in soybeans primarily, uh, resolve has it as an ingredient in its combo. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, my, when I saw the comment, I was like, yeah, I think I remember this, unfortunately. And so, um, for me, the, the, the brush with it was, um, we were spraying it in the combo and in, in soybeans and I sent the guys out to do uh, spray a second pivot and they said, there's no chemical left. And I said, well, that's not possible. I ordered 60 liters of mesoper and it's in the, in the, in the chemical room and, the rate to apply was 600 mLs per hectare and it had got applied at six liters per hectare. And it's one of the most persistent residuals um, that affects wheat. And of course, wheat is our cash crop. Soybeans is sometimes an annoyance, sometimes an entertainment. Um, and so, um, you know, I was in despair. That's for us about $60,000 worth of wheat, um, you know, kind of flushed down the toilet. For who knows how long, because I mean, that's 10 times the rate we were intending to apply. And so we had to find out, is there a way to redeem it um, post post soybeans? And so that's kind of what launched us into having that conversation about it. And so maybe for us about it, we ended up doing is calling around and, and thinking about what options we had. And at the point of not growing wheat, you have a lot of options because you have nothing to start with. So we said, well, let's try some stuff. So we put down um, a pretty significant dose of micronized gypsum, try to open up pore structure. And then we also apply it around four kgs a hectare of humic acid, um, to try to help, um, impact that. And, you know, amazingly to my shock, actually, to the, to the testament to the resilience of, of the world, um, we did grow a significant wheat crop there and we couldn't see any residual effect the following season. Um, but we did have to water it and grow cover crops, those kind of things in between. Yeah. So, I mean, like many, uh, different herbicides, you can have, um, a range of, of period of period of time for that residual, if you will. And, and this one's no exception. I mean, you've got the, the high side is, or, or the low side, it could be persistent for, you know, 20 days on the low side and all conditions ideal, moist, et cetera, that, that being a label rate, um, for an over application that definitely throws us farther. And then, you know, some of the conditions that make it more 
persistent would be a low pH and and dry soils, you know. So which is so common here. You know, and low pH soils is the norm. Um and that then dry. And I think like this year, the guy that got into trouble, I mean, we had rain for really consistently for two months. And so you apply it and then you're you're into dry. And so the the breakdown period became short. This can be nothing almost. And so, you know, what's interesting is we, we were discussing this and we're saying, well, look, there's there's really there's there's the chemistry side of things, the chemistry which can really, you know, we consider um, minerals and and carbon substances to be regenerative. Um, you know, they're natural. It's what's in the soil matrix between humus and and the soil minerals, et cetera. That's that's natural. So still a natural process. So there's the the chemistry side, which would be your humic acid, your gypsum, your other minerals, and other things. Even you know, azomite or some of those could be thrown in there. But then there's the biologic side. Now, interestingly enough, you know, it's not just one or the other, because you know, okay, humic acid from a chemical standpoint, yeah, is a very good binder of sorts because it's it's carbon, you know, complex rings and it, it has multiple binding sites. So when you put humic acid down, you know, okay, it, it's a good place for um, maybe stray chemistry, strain, minerals, whatever, to have a life raft to kind of bind to so that they're not freely engaged with other things. Um, and then the on the, the gypsum side, I mean, calcium is huge for, on a number of levels, but sulfur is actually massive in that it's a, a very um, catalytic. It's a catalyst. It's needed and required from any different chemical reactions and exchanges it's a very strong anion i mean on its own s8 um it's completely it actually has an, a valence potential of six meaning you can go to minus four and plus two so sulfur is like the great catalyst apart from oxygen and hydrogen is probably the most catal um catalytic elements in this in, in agriculture and i would argue in human in, in 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 all living systems and so then then it bridges uh, you can see a sulfur is a great bridge into the biological side, the, the living side, um, because sulfur is required for um, to produce glutathione and um, glutamate and other essential amino acids. And we know in uh, with microbes, it's required to a certain level. And it, the when we have a sufficient rate, the soil microorganisms that can help degrade these are able to do their job better. But that being said, that's a bridge and a segue to kind of another way to look at it. And so I would argue that putting on humic acid and gypsum is um, a more chemistry approach to um, the problem, but a good one. When we have us, it's it's based on living natural systems. But then something that I'd like to mention, though, that we see is the, the power of harnessing those beneficial microorganisms. Um, and we see study after study um and we you know we know there's when there's uh oil spills for instance what are they using these days they're using beneficial microbes to break those down and generally speaking um a lot of those oddly enough a lot of the time for those beneficial microbes that work but the chemistry the chemical the, the bad guy is a food source which is hard for us to think there's actually some really interesting work done by some of the um godfathers of regen um, where they actually talk about the benefit of oil spills or diesel spills on the farm, that it actually fed beneficial organism on the kind of like, ooh, dare we talk about that? Um, and so what we find, what we found time and time again, is that using beneficial soil microorganisms with a food source to help feed those, because look, they work for free. Um, will reduce half-life of chemistries massive and so um to know something to know that the life is safe um not a disclaimer you know I'm, I'm not saying that this has been proven i don't want to say that yeah. but i will say that it has been proven that fusarium is greater of NPA, which is what glyphosate degrades too and so just taking us down the rabbit hole so when you spray glyphosate too close to your crop if you choose to do that 
and you wonder why you have more fusarium in your wheat, it's because it was there to clean up the glyphosate and your wheat remains to be fed on after the glyphosate has been broken down. So anyway, just a painful truth. No, it's true though. I mean, there are very few natural organisms, oil microorganisms in most agricultural soils left to degrade and well. And fusarium is one of them. And so, yeah, it's a bit of a double-edged sword there. Now, I say that the caveat, I believe, is, and you know, I say that's probably the most prevalent organism in our soil that's left in conventionally farmed or even just monoculture, traditional type um, crop settings that will do it. That's not to say there aren't many other beneficial microorganisms that will, but they're probably not just in high amounts in our soils because our conditions are really harmful to them. And I think that's one of the main reasons we see such benefits when we use aerobic microbial teas from um, diverse sources, you know, chiefly one of the easiest and one of our favorites, high quality worm castings. Um, all the classes that are listed there are going to degrade certain chemicals, including the one we're discussing today. Um, and we'll put link um, in the show notes to some of those um, studies, those peer reviewed studies that show, in fact, you know, pseudomonas, actinomycetes, et cetera. These all break down this chemical we're speaking of now. High quality. For free. High quality. So we really believe, okay, let's, but then let's support with like what we use our product, Soil Vigor, why? Because it has an elastic food source. It has biochar. And biochar is much like humic acid in that it's a carbon source, which has binding sites. But we use micronized biochar, which is much, much, much smaller than a humic acid mold. Very small, very absorbent. And you can think, I mean, if we get sick, and we have toxicity. What do we all do? And you take uh, activated charcoal. It goes into our stomach, and those chemicals bind to it, rendered inert, and can be eliminated. And so we see the same thing. I mean, you can see it in livestock, animals will do it on their own in the wild, and it's no different. You know, we look at the soil, it's much like the stomach of a cow, you know. Um, so that's, that's something that we used to be as probably the so what's the best strategy well and we them all right make sure we're applying we can apply humic acid we can apply gypsum we can apply soil microbial teas we can apply a a beneficial soil and we um and boy i just described and we 80 percent of the soil craft programs because it's not about a silver bullet it's about cropping systems right and I think, you know, if you break that down, you basically have, we talked about chemistry, but you're saying, hey, I've got a problem. You discover it happened. Let me immediately take action on the soil. Now you're saying, oh, I've got a crop that's now suffering. Okay, now what do we do? Well, you're going to get, you're going to bind up as much of it as you can through the humix and and the, you know, the, the carbon-based sources. You're going to deal with your plant and that's where you know if you can get foliar um you know pharmaceutical grade carbon systems like what's in in some of the leaf products that actually helps to extract chemistry um and it balances out of the plant itself and you can actually see that in the sap analysis that you can literally extract um some of the chemistry out of those plants um and then you have yeah put the microbes on and accelerate the breakdown. And so, you know, your your carbons now are, are binding to a poison. So it's present in the soil in an inactive form longer, but the microbes then you bring in to take it out. And so one is bind it up. Two is get my plant back to a healthier state. And three is eliminate it from the system. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I mean, the beauty of it is this is actually a bit of a, like a regenerative way to deal with a, a symptom, um, which we, we try not to do, but it happens. You know, it happens. You have over applications, et cetera. And it's nice to know that there's a way to deal with, the, deal with it acutely. But then the other exciting thing is, again, these prescriptions are basically aspects of what we consider our, our crop program. So imagine if you're just, if this is business as usual, with what you're doing this as a crop program, then all of a sudden these residuals 
are likely going to be maybe even a non-issue or at least one that you you don't have to worry about. Meaning, what I mean by that is you can rest assured that if you're doing these things, whatever the label says, and Wield will likely respond as as the label prescribes, and it will help take care of some of those outliers. Maybe your low pH, maybe your your dry seasons, etc. It will allow your systems to act and behave better, or as well as the label says, and maybe even better. You might even see might even see those things working better, giving you more freedom. It you know it reminds me. Um, recently I was watching a video, and you know there's this mountain biker right on the like knife edge of I'm I'm assuming it was a mountain in Switzerland or something, riding this ridiculous thing. And I think in farming we find ourselves, you know, we say we're living between the devil and the deep blue sea a lot. You're always making this decision, but it affects that decision. And the nice thing is if you're doing the the right regenerative things, if you're following those principles, you know, the chance that you have both your feet on the ground Mm -hmm. instead of you're standing on one foot, one toe, leaning on the top of the mountain and any little wind blows you off. The the reality is we live in a world where things happen and you actually get much less demanding um, from a reactive management standpoint and you get to be more demanding on the proactive management standing it just makes farming a lot more fun in the season. Yeah, that's right. You get more resiliency. And and this is a great segue into our next podcast, um, next week, weekly podcast, which um, I'd like to tackle and call. So what are you really so against in conventional agriculture anyway? Um, or I'd like to just explore for a brief period, um, you know, why does it sound like we're, I'm just so against the conventional way? And in fact, I think I, I would argue that I'm, I'm not against using um, proven tools. Um, I'm just against the consequences that come with them and the hamster wheel that it puts you on. So join us next week as we talk about that. So in other words, all the egg junkies, get your popcorn out. Next week it's going out. All right. Thanks for joining us. Um, stay tuned. Please leave comments like, subscribe, et cetera, but please leave us your topics as well. Like we're going to do our best to talk, to tackle things as they're coming, but that's not to say if you have some, some, something you'd like to tackle this week in regen where you are, um, please give us a, give us a suggestion so we can tackle what's happening in your neck of the woods. Thanks so much for joining us as we expand our paradigms and explore what's possible in the realm of regen agronomy. If you would like to contact us or learn more about what we do, please visit our website at www.soilcraft.com, as well as our YouTube channel. If you have topics you would like us to unpack or stories, please connect with us so that we can share them with others.